Welcome to the Shoreword channel. We're dedicated to sharing powerful, inspiring and motivational messages and sermons by men of God with you on this channel. If this is your first time here, kindly consider subscribing to us. Please sit back and enjoy today's inspiring message. God bless you. Right, what I want to talk to you about today, and that is this. A couple of years ago, I was doing some research on the state of the church in America, and I discovered some devastating things. In basically, um, Barna had done some in-depth research, but I want to say this, from the year 2010 to the year 2020, over 45 million Americans stopped praying. Okay, now that's crazy when you think about it. 45 million. That is 20% of America. Stop praying. It goes even further. And, I, and that's why I was so excited when Matt asked me to be a part of this prayer series. The other stat that riveted me was the fact that over 30 million Americans from the year 2000 till today have walked away from the faith. They've basically gone from practicing Christians to non-practicing Christians. And by non-practicing Christian, we're talking about atheists, agnostics, and spiritualists. So here's the thing that we've got to ask. Why are so many people stop praying? And by the way, Jesus said men ought to always pray and not to faint, Luke 18, verse 1. So what's happening? The people are fainting. They're walking away from the faith. I mean, I have a pastor friend who has three sons. He had a couple come up to them. They had three sons called to ministry. They went to universities and they came back as agnostics, all three of them. All right, so what's going on? What's happening? This caused me to go into a really deep dive. And I wrote this book called The Awe of God. I believe this is the focus of why we are losing so many people. Why so many people are not praying is we've lost the healthy fear of God. And I'm gonna say this. I know I'm speaking to 14 campuses this morning. Look, you can get this on Amazon. And in fact, Amazon's got it for a big sale right now. You're all Prime members. You'll get it in two days, okay? So just go to, to Amazon. We've actually got a QR code that will show you at the end of the service. You can put your phone up. But I wrote 42 chapters, short chapters, because people don't read today. And you can read the chapter in seven minutes. And if you're slow, nine minutes, because I really want to get this into you because I want to see a stop to people walking away from the faith. So this is the question I had to ask. Why are so many people stopping to pray? Why are so many people walking away from the faith? I believe it's this. It's the absence of the presence of God. Now, I want to say this, church. Listen to me carefully. The presence of God is a very real aspect of Christianity. Jesus made a statement in John chapter 14. He said, I will love him or her and manifest myself to him or her. Now, the word manifest is amazing. It means to reveal clearly to bring to light. It means to disclose. It's when God reveals himself to our physical senses. It's the tangible presence of God. Now, why is it important? Because Moses made a statement that I believe is still true today. He said, your presence among us sets your people in me apart from all other people that are on the earth. If you look at Psalm 1 or 16, verse 11, it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. Now think about it. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? What is causing people to walk away from the faith? It's the lack of strength. They've lost that joy because joy, true joy is found in the presence of the Lord. So now comes the big question. Why are Christians today, when Jesus says, I will manifest myself to you, why are Christians today not experiencing the tangible presence of God? All right, here's the answer because of a lack of holiness. Now, right there, I know a lot of people are gonna start getting nervous, okay? You say the word holiness and people shut down. And there's actually a pretty good reason for it. And that is because in the past, we have had mean-spirited preachers, okay? I'm talking about pastors, preachers that don't even like people. Can I say something? Okay, if, if you don't like people, you got no business teaching the Bible. You should, be, you should be teaching organic chemistry or physics, okay? Should not be teaching the Bible. 
But these mean-spirited preachers made holiness into a bunch of rules and regulations to govern people's behavior into what they thought was correct. And that is nothing to do with holiness. So other people get nervous when they hear the word holiness because they see it as being dull and boring. But I love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis made the statement. He said, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one re- meets the real thing, it's irresistible. And so what I want to talk to you about today is the irresistible. Amen? Now, what happened? When people got nervous about holiness, we had a bunch of pastors and teachers, and they were clever, and they said, wait a minute, we can't ignore this subject. I mean, it's all over the Bible. If you look at the predominant characteristic of God in the Bible, and the angels are crying out before the throne, holy, 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 they're not crying love, love, love. I mean, God is love. He doesn't even have love. He is love. They're not crying faithful, faithful, faithful. God is faithful. The attribute of God that stands above all others as you read through scripture is holiness. If you look at the only description of the church that Jesus is coming back for, it's a holy church. It's not a leadership church. I believe in leadership. It's not a community church. I believe in community. God does too. He says it's not good that man's alone. It's not a relevant church. We're never going to read the lost if we're not relevant, right? It's a holy church. So these teachers said, what do we do about this? Holiness is all over the Bible. So they came up with a teaching and they said to all of us, don't worry about holiness. Don't worry at all about it because Jesus is our holiness. Now, here's the problem with what happened. What they're saying is true, but it's not the full story. Because what they did basically is they lumped all holiness into one bucket. When in reality, the New Testament shows there's two buckets of holiness, all right? The first one is called positional holiness. What do I mean by positional holiness? Ephesians 1.4 makes the statement. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now notice, he did that. He chose us in him that we should be holy. So here's what happened. Before the foundations of the world, God the Father and the Son had a meeting and God says, we're gonna create man, but we know the end from the beginning. We know they're gonna mess up. Would you be willing to go die for them? And the Son said, yes, of course I would because I love them all so much, right? So God says, the Father says, when they receive you as their Lord, we will declare them holy at that point, okay? That is positional holiness. The moment you receive Jesus, you were declared by God to be holy, all right? Now, if you look at the Apostle Paul, he says, a man leaves his father and mother's joined to his wife, the two shall become one. He said, but this is actually an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. So if you want to really understand how to have an authentic relationship with God, you look at a marriage. Now, Lisa and I, 42 years ago, this October 2nd, okay, 42 years ago, she walked down the aisle of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Lafayette, Indiana. And on that very day, October 2nd, 1982, she became my wife. I got news for you today. In 2024, she is not more my wife today positionally than the day I married her. And 40 years from now, she is not going to be more my wife. Well, it's the same thing with our walk with God. The moment we got saved, he declared us holy. And 20 million years from today, we're not going to be more holy than we were the day we were saved because that's what God declared. Are you seeing this? But now let me say this. When Lisa and I got married, something kind of changed because when we were single, Lisa used to flirt with guys. Okay, believe it or not, she did, okay? She would go out with other guys on dates. She would give guys her phone numbers. But after we got married, Lisa stopped flirting with guys. She stopped giving her phone number out. She stopped going out on dates with other guys. What happened? She developed a behavior that matched her position. Are you getting this? All right, so now that's called behavioral holiness. And if you look at what Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15, he says, live as children of obedience to God. Do not conform yourselves to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves also be holy in all your conduct 
and manner of living. Now he's talking about a behavior. This is behavior holiness. Now, this is important because holiness, without it, you're not going to get the presence of God. Okay? This is the big, big question of the day. What does holiness have to do with the presence of God? See, what the legalistic holiness teachers did is they made holiness an end to itself. They almost made it like a club. When in reality, the behavior of holiness is a doorway into something. And it's the doorway into what every true believer cries out for. And that's what I want to talk to you about. What does holiness have to do with God's presence? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. This is amazing scripture. It says, pursue holiness. Did you hear the word pursue? Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Okay, now let's, let's talk about this. First of all, what does the word pursue mean in the original language? It is defined as this, to chase after with the intent to apprehend. Listen to that carefully. The word pursue means to chase after with the intent to apprehend. It speaks of urgency and intensity. Now, let's ask a question here. Chase after with the intent to apprehend holiness. Is he talking about positional holiness or behavioral holiness? Okay, let, let's just do another example. Lisa has a Bible study that she goes to on Wednesday mornings, right? Can you imagine her going to the Bible study and they're all doing prayers? And Lisa looks at the ladies and says, guys, I need you to pray. I am chasing after with the intent to apprehend being John Bevere's wife. They'd all laugh at her and say, you became his wife 42 years ago. What are you talking about? That wouldn't make any sense. But if she looked at her girlfriends and she said, hey, girls, pray, I'm chasing after with the intent to apprehend a behavior that is more befitting John Bevere's wife, they would understand that. So we know immediately he's not talking about positional holiness. He's talking about behavioral holiness. All right. Now look at this scripture. Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Everybody is going to see the Lord. Revelations 1 verse 7 says, behold, he comes in the clouds and every eye will behold him, even those who pierced him, even those who drove the nails into his hands and feet. At the judgment seat, every eye is going to see him. So what in the world is he talking about in Hebrews 12, 14? Pursue or chase after holiness because without it, no one's gonna see the Lord. What does the word see mean? All right, let me give you an example here. I've been a United States citizen now for 65 years. On that 65 year time period, I think I've been under 13 United States presidents. I'm under their rulership. Their decisions affect my life. I am submitted to their leadership, but I've never seen one of them. I've never been in the presence of a United States president. Now they have friends they work with, they see them on a daily basis. They work with them, but I have never been in the presence or seen a United States president. Well, let me say this, there are Christians, they're under the Lordship of Jesus. His decisions affect their lives, but they're not seeing him, they're not in his presence. So what he's talking about here is without holiness, no one's gonna enter into the presence of the Lord. Remember I said holiness is a doorway into something bigger? It's a doorway into intimacy and enjoying the presence of God. And this is what every one of us cry out for. Now, let me, let me say this. I'm gonna prove it to you. Jesus looks at his disciples before he leaves and he makes this statement. John 14, 21, this is really important. The person who has my commands, hear the word commands? Now, now, people get nervous with commands. Did you know there's over 500 commands in the New Testament? Okay, now let me say this. Commands in the Old Testament were given to earn a relationship with God. We proved we can never, ever keep the commands of God and earn a relationship with him. That's why Jesus had to die and give us the free gift of salvation, correct? So what are commands for in the New Testament? They are given to enhance our relationship. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it to you. The person, I mean, I mean, just think about it. 
What is Jesus' last words on the earth? He said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations, right? Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Remember, Jesus said in John 15, 14, the person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me, okay? All right, so the person who has my commands is John 14, 21, and keeps them is the one who really loves me, and I will love him and will show, now look at this, reveal or manifest myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen. Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. Okay, let me say this. Let's go back to the marriage. I am legally married to Lisa Bevere. I have actually a marriage certificate that shows I'm married to Lisa Bevere. I got it 42 years ago in Indiana, all right? Now, I could technically hold that marriage license up and say, babe, we're married. But if I'm in jumping in bed with other women, I'm gonna lose something. What am I gonna lose? I'm gonna lose those moments in which our heads are on the pillow and she looks at me and she says something to me from the deepest places of her heart that she wouldn't say to anybody else. I guarantee you, I will lose that. What people lose when they don't chase after holiness is when God whispers those things to our heart that we've never known before, that people are hungry for. This is what we lose. You know, I've written 24 books. See, let, let, let me just say it like this. There's a reason I don't commit adultery against my wife. And it's not because I know she'll take me out because she is a sharpshooter. She's a sniper. <laughs> it's because I don't want to lose that intimacy. Now, there's a reason I don't commit adultery against Jesus. You say, well, commit adultery? James makes a pretty clear statement. James chapter 4. He says, my brethren... 15 times in this book. He says, my brethren, you seek a relationship with the world. You are an adulterer. Who are you committing adultery against? Jesus. When we seek to flirt with, date, give our phone number to, the very things that drove the nails into his hand and feet, we're committing adultery against him. And what do we lose? Yeah, we can technically say, I prayed the sinner's prayer, Jesus. I got, I got it right here that if I confess you as my Lord and Savior, I, 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 I'm a Christian. But I guarantee you what you're going to lose is when he whispers those secrets in your heart that you've never known before. People ask me all the time, they say, how in the world have you written 24 books? Where do you get all that revelation from? I am preaching about it right now. The reason I don't want to commit adultery with the world is I don't want to miss the times when he whispers those things in my heart that I've never known, never seen before. The things that will change my life first and change other lives second. I don't ever want to lose it. And that, because I've tasted it, is more valuable to me than anything you can offer me that this world craves and goes after. Amen. So you see the holy, yeah, it's a good place to clap. I'm okay with that. So the holiness legalistic teachers, what they did is they removed, removed the beauty of holiness. Holiness is a doorway that enters into a place of deep intimacy with God. Jesus said that person that is chasing after with the intent to apprehend my commands is the person that I'm going to make myself really known to. Now, what's interesting is it doesn't say the person who arrives at holiness will be the one who sees God. What does that mean? That means all my life, I'm gonna be chasing after with the intent to apprehend holiness. And to be very honest with you, the person who's really doing that actually doesn't become more proud. They actually become more humble. Some of the most godly people that I've been around are the people that are more aware of their flaws than others that I've met. Because when you really come to know him, you walk in a deeper humility. Because Jesus is the most humble human being that's ever walked this earth. He humbled himself to the point of obedience to the Father. 
He was so dependent that he said, I can't do anything except I see my father do it. Why did he see his father doing what his father was doing? Why did he hear what his father was saying and say, I could only say what my father was saying? It's because he walked in a holiness in behavior because he is the Holy One. And he's called us to be conformed into his image. And so Paul writes the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that I quite frankly think, why have we ignored this? But Paul makes a statement, as God says, I will live in them. I want you to listen to these words. I will live in them and I will walk among them. Now I want us to step back and think about who's talking here. We're not talking about a Hollywood actor, a great notable athlete, We're not talking about the president of the United States or somebody else you admire. We're talking about the one who created the heavens and the earth. He said, I'm going to live in you and I'm going to walk among you. Okay, now you have to understand, we got to remember who this is. This is the one who put the stars in the universe with his fingers and called everyone by name. This is the one who measured the length of the universe with the span of his hand. This is the one that weighed every drop of water on the planet in the palm of his hand. This is the one that weighed all the mountains around here that you see all around here, okay, in his scales. This is the one, Isaiah, who was the most godly man in Israel. God brings him out of his body in Isaiah 6, plops him right in front of the throne. The angels are crying holy, shake in an arena that is... Seats over a billion beings. They're crying holy so loud. They're shaking that arena to its foundations in heaven. Isaiah sees the Lord and doesn't go, dude, (laughs) check it out. There's the man upstairs. He's on his face. This this most godly man in his whole generation on his face groveling. And he cries out, woe is me. I am completely undone. Undone means I'm coming apart at the seams because for the first time in his life, he realizes who it is he's really serving. And the first time in his life, he realizes who he is before this holy God. You know, I love what Oswald Chambers says. Oswald Chambers says, when we preach the love of God, there is a danger of forgetting that the Bible reveals not first the love of God, but the intense blazing holiness of God with his love at the center of that holiness. Okay, so here's Isaiah. He's crying out, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to the drunkard, woe to the proud. In Isaiah 5, but Isaiah 6, he has one glimpse of God. It's no longer woe to the sinner, it's woe is me. If you look at Job, God himself said, Job is the most godly man on the planet. Job gets one glimpse of God and he says, I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. I went to church, I heard my pastor talking about you, but now my eye sees you, I utterly abhor myself. If you look at Moses, the closest man to God in his generation, He has one glimpse of God in his glory and he cries out, so terrifying is this sight. He said, I trembled with fear. If you look at John the apostle, he was the closest one to Jesus. He had one glimpse of Jesus on the deserted island of Patmos in his glory and he fell down like a dead man when he saw him. I remember when my boys, boy, they were back, they were like 12 years old down to four years old. And this is back when a certain NBA player, who I still think is the best NBA player that's ever played, but he was huge. He was winning his six world championships. There were posters of him in in the boys' rooms. Their friends would come all over. All they're talking about is Michael, 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 right? And I got fed up with hearing about Michael, okay? And, and, I, and I'm an athlete. I played college at D1 athletics. I mean, I'm, I, I love athletics, okay? But I was just fed up with hearing about Michael. And I remember we were on the Atlantic Ocean and I was preaching for a church there in the Atlantic Ocean and and, and they put put me up in a hotel right on the beach. I had Lisa and the four boys with me. And I remember the the, the Atlantic was stirred up that day. They were trying to body surf and they were getting slammed. They were getting sand in their mouth, in their suits. It was great, right? So I thought, this is my chance. So we walked up to the hotel room. I on purpose opened the sliding door so they could hear the pounding ocean. They're all wrapped in their towels. And I said, guys, I want to have a little dad talk with you. I said, that's a pretty powerful ocean out there, isn't it? They went, whoa, yeah, whoa, it's powerful. I said, it's a pretty big ocean, isn't it, guys? They go, yeah. I said, you know, you can only see one mile out. It goes another 4,000 miles. And there's another one on the other side. It's a bigger. And there's two others beside that. They go, whoa. And I said, do you know God weighed every drop of that water in the palm of his hands? 
And I said, you're enamored with this guy that can jump from a 15 foot line and put a little ball through a hole. (laughs) He went, dad, we got it. We got it. Right. So you know what happened after that day? Michael got back into perspective. See, Isaiah 45, 15 says, you are a God who hides yourself. He hides his glory from us to see if we're going to be enamored with the movie stars, with the incredible guru businessmen, with the athletes, or if we're going to see his glory because he's revealed his glory in our hearts. That's where we see his glory. He has revealed the glory of God in our hearts in the face of Christ Jesus. So my boys, what happened is their focus went from that to that. And all four of them are walking with Jesus and all four of them have worked up with us in ministry. So God says, I will watch this in second Corinthians six. I will live in them. Here's promise. Number one, I'll walk among them. Promise. Number two, I'll be their God. Promise. Number three, and they will be my people. Promise. Number four, and I will be your father. Promise five. You will be my sons and daughters. Promises six and seven. Now watch the very next verse. Because we have these seven promises, I'm putting the number seven in here to make it clear. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Let us cleanse ourselves. Do you notice he doesn't say the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse us? Whoa, Matt, Pastor Matt. I can't believe you just had this guy in here. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Whoa, I am not saying the blood of Jesus does not cleanse us. Believe me, it cleanses us from all filthiness. But what I am saying is don't confuse the work of justification with the work of sanctification. Okay, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. That's a big word. Those are big words. The work of justification, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, God cleanses you from all sin. In the spirit, you are declared holy and spotless and blameless before God. But at that very moment, the work of sanctification begins. That's when what's done on the inside of me is worked out to the outside. That is called sanctification, and that we have to cooperate with the grace and the holy fear of God to accomplish. Notice Paul says that we cleanse ourselves from all Not 99%, but all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Now, let's just talk about this. Filthiness of the flesh? Yes. Let me just show you a couple scriptures. I don't know why we don't talk about this anymore. Because we're hurting people by not talking about it. If I want to keep you from the presence of God, I'm going to avoid talking about these things. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, God's will for you is to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. Can I say something? It amazes me. It literally amazes me. How many times people will come up to me, I'm traveling, I'm in a hotel. They recognize me as an author. They come up, they talk. Oh yeah, we're living together until we get married next next year. You know, we're just making sure we're financially secure. And I'm like, you're living together? And you just said that like without even blushing? Look at this. He who rejects this does not reject man, but God. I'm like, have you not read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse four, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornication, those who have sex before marriage and adulterers, God will judge. I mean, have you not read this? You'd be amazed that 67% of the men right now in churches in America are bound to pornography. I was bound to pornography. I'm not throwing stones. I got addicted at 11 and I got free May 6th, 1985. And I'm still free to this day. Thank God. And what I'm talking to you about this morning, the awe of God, the holy fear of God is what set me free. And I'm still free to this day. So men, there is hope. But you know, we know the psalmist said, I will put nothing. I will be careful to live a blameless life. I will lead a life of integrity in my own home. I will refuse to look at anything worthless or wicked. I will reject perverse ideas and stay away from every evil. This was David's heart. Okay. Did he walk it out? 1,000% perfectly, we all know he didn't, but he was chasing after it. Do you see what the difference? There's a difference when somebody goes, hey, I'm a, I'm just a guy with needs. Come on, you know what? Uh, my, my, my marriage bed's not stimulating me anymore. I need some pornography to kind of get me in the mood. Really? Now, I understand somebody goes, I fell into something and I'm trying to get through it, right? I understand somebody battling it. 
I was battling it for six years after becoming a Christian. But when we sit there and go, oh, it's okay. We're just human beings. We have needs. We're actually denying people the privilege of walking into the presence of God and hearing that word that gives me the strength so I'm not a statistic of 45 million that stopped praying and 30 million that walked away from the faith. Do you understand why I'm saying this? I'm not saying this to beat you up and say, get into a holiness club. I'm saying this because I know you're craving to walk with God and to hear his word. And I have news for you. He, listen, listen, here's the thing. I'm on a radio program one time and the guy's like, what about the guy that's got problems with pornography. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I had problems with pornography. And the Lord set me free and I'm still free today. Let me just make sure I understand what you're saying. Are you saying on this live radio broadcast that the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to get me free from the penalty of sin, but it's just not powerful enough to get me free from the bondage of sin? Is that what you're saying? And the guy went, uh, 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 uh. He realized the foolishness of what he was saying. And I said, do you understand you're keeping people from God's presence? You're actually encouraging people. I don't want to do that. I know what has kept me in the faith. And it's the fact of having intimacy with God. And I want everybody to have that and enjoy that. That's what he's called us to. He's called us to intimacy. And so filthiness of the spirit. Oh, that's another one. I don't have time for it. You can see it in the book because I spent a whole section in the book. Filthiness of the spirit basically means your motives and intentions. If you look at Ananias and Sapphira, their acts were just fine as far as their actions. They gave an offering. There's nothing wrong with that. But what caused them to lie about that offering? They wanted to project themselves, project, hello, as being the biggest givers in the church. So they kept back part of the property, but they wanted to be seen as giving all their property. And in Acts chapter 5, that couple fell over dead. I mean, that's crazy. Why? Because when you lie in the presence of the glory of God, there's going to be a reaction. Okay? This is what we've got to realize. God came to liberate us. We were bound to sin. We had a nature that sinned. And he liberated us by freeing us. But now he's given us a choice. Are we going to listen to our flesh or are we going to listen to our spirit? Because here's the greatest news of all. Let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 6 or 2 Corinthians 6, and I've got to get there. Because we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Here's the thing I want to say. You're probably sitting there going, John, I've tried to walk in holiness and I've failed. I've tried to walk in holiness and I've failed. I got news for you. God's given us a way to walk, to have the power to walk a godly life. And that's called the fear of the Lord. You say the fear of the Lord? Wait a minute. Being scared of God? No. The fear of the Lord has nothing to do with being afraid of God. Let me say this. Before I t- give you the definition of what the fear of God is, it, we are told in Isaiah 33, verse 6, that the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. We are told in Isaiah eleven three that the fear of the Lord is Jesus' delight. Now there's something to this. When we're talking about God's treasure and Jesus' delight, we gotta be, we gotta talk about this. Are you with me? Okay. What is the fear of the Lord? It's not to be scared of God. It's to be scared of being away from him. When Moses brought Israel to the mountain and God came down on the mountain, the people ran away and Moses made a statement in Exodus 20, 20. He said, hey, do not fear because God's come to test you to see if his fear is in you so that you may not sin. Wait a minute. Do not fear because God's come to see if his fear is in you. Sounds like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. No, he's talking about the, he's differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. There's a difference. The person who's scared of God is something to hide. What does Adam do when he sins against the Lord? He hides from the presence of the Lord. Person who fears God is nothing to hide. That person's actually terrified of being away from God. So if you want your first definition of the holy fear of God, it's to be terrified of being away from him. Why are people walking away from God? Because they lack the fear of God. Psalm 19 tells us that the fear of the Lord is what gives us the ability to walk with God forever. Lucifer led worship right before that throne. He was anointed to do so. He didn't fear God. He didn't endure it in heaven forever. Ever. A third of the angels surrounded God's throne. They didn't fear God. They didn't endure forever. Adam and Eve walked in the presence of God's glory. 
They didn't fear God. They didn't endure forever. So what is the holy fear of God? It is when we stand in awe of him. It's what happened when those boys realized, wow, he held that water in his hand. And we're all enamored by a guy who can hold a basketball. Wow. When you really see him, and this is what you'll do in your heart. This is what the fear of God does. It opens up your heart so you can behold his glory in your heart. All of a sudden, the things of this world begin to fade compared to him. When you don't have him, the things of this world will enamor you. They will, they will literally cause you to be in awe. But when you see him, it puts that, everything in the world back into perspective. So we fear God by reverencing and honoring him and valuing him above everything and everyone else. And here's the really good news. The fear of the Lord is actually a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus delighted in. And we can ask God to fill us with that fear and he does it. And all of a sudden now, things come into perspective. That's what I hope happens as you go through the Awe of God book. I'm really believing that you're gonna encounter the presence of the Lord. We have had so many testimonies of people that have been changed. They said, John, I encountered the presence of God and my life is so changed. This is what we're believing for because I don't wanna see any more people walking away from the faith. I wanna encourage you to do Bible studies with it. We have, we have workbooks. I'm believing, and God showed me this and I'm gonna close. The final move of his spirit before Jesus returns is gonna be a move of the fear of God. If you look at the Jesus revolution, we found out our daddy loved us. The love of God keeps us from legalism, but the fear of God keeps us from lawlessness. And the church that Jesus is coming back for is a holy church. I believe this move of the holy awe of God will create the church that Jesus is gonna come back for, a holy bride without spot or wrinkle. I hope you got something out of this today. I love you so much and I want every head bowed I want every eye closed on all of our campuses. The first step to having intimacy with God is to have an authentic, genuine relationship with him. When you look at a bride and she puts on a white dress and she walks down an aisle of a church, she's actually saying something pretty significant. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. She's saying, this is the one and only man I'm giving the rest of my life to. That doesn't make her the perfect bride the first week, the first year, the first 50 years. It just means she's given her entire heart to that groom. Jesus is called the groom. We are called the bride. I know that you could never imagine a young man proposing to a girl and saying, would you be my wife? And she squeals with excitement, says, I am so excited to be married to you but I did date Jim for two years and I'd like two nights a year in bed with him. I'll love you more. You will be my favorite, but I want two nights with Jim a year. No bride would, has ever done that. No groom would ever accept that. Jesus gave himself fully for you so that you could become a child of God. All he asks for you to do is to do what that bride does. He doesn't ask any more than what a spouse asks for. He asks you for your entire heart. So if you're ready to give your heart to him today and you say, John, I wanna give my life to the Lordship of Jesus. I want you to stand wherever you are. I just want you to stand. And the reason I'm asking you to stand right now is because no bride's ever been ashamed of her groom. Let me tell you, Jesus gave his life. He died. He created you, but yet he chose to come and be. Thank you for joining us on the Sure Word channel. May the blessings of today's message stay with you. Feel free to engage in the comment section and remember to like, share and subscribe for more uplifting content. Until next time, go and win with Jesus.